Hello and welcome to today's lesson, a review of linear regression, both linear regression working with the individual points in the equation, and then also hypothesis testing and confidence intervals of linear regression. So now, when we look at linear regression, the first thing we want to do is think about the linear regression equation. Remember, this equation is an estimation equation that's why we use the y hat symbol and we always start with our y intercept and then finish up with our slope times x. Okay, so you want to make sure that you're defining the two variables properly. Okay, the y intercept is the value of y when the x variable equals 0 and you always want to think about that in context. Okay, so remember, we're talking about the meaning of that value. And then when we talk about slope, it's the amount that y increases or decreases when x increases by one unit. So now, when we're dealing with some individual data values, um, things that you might be required to do, you might be required to build a linear regression equation. If you are required to build it, Okay, you want to look on the formula sheet because we have the equations for this formula on the formula sheet. Everything would start with finding your slope value. Okay, so the slope is r, and we'll talk about what r is here in a couple slides, times standard deviation of y divided by standard deviation of x. They would either have to give you this information, and hopefully they would do that, or they would have to give you the data table in which you could find that information. Now, once you have your slope, then the next step is finding your y-intercept value, okay, that starting value for the equation, and that's when you use the average of the y's and the average of the x's along with the slope that you have found to find that y-intercept value. Okay, once again, a very rare procedure that you might have to do. Okay, but remember, you've got your formula sheet there for backup whenever they're asking you to build individual equations. They need to be able to give you the equation on the formula sheet. So now, we want to think about our interpretations of those values. Okay, we talked about the interpretation of slope for each unit increase in x, there is an approximate increase decrease of the slope value in y, and then we also have the correlation coefficient, okay, the correlation coefficient is our r value, okay, we saw it in the last slide, we'll talk about how you can find it formula wise, okay, usually the calculator is going to end up giving that to us as we go through this material. And when we talk about uh, correlation coefficient, you want to talk about the direction, strength, and type of association. Is it linear? Is it nonlinear? Okay. Is it positive or negative? And is it strong or weak association? Okay. Now, one thing that you have to be careful of, they don't give too many questions of this, but we're hitting on some of the big ideas here, is the idea of stra extrapolation. When we're using our least squares regression line, we don't want to use it to make any predictions outside of the set of x values that was used to find the equation, because we don't know what's going to happen next. The best example I can give of this is on September 10th, 2001, Okay, investing in airlines was one of the best investments you could do. Every model would have told you to keep investing. Okay, we just didn't know what was going to happen on September 11th, 2001. Okay, that actually caused almost all of the airlines to go bankrupt or go into financial hardship. Okay, so that's why we have to be careful of extrapolation. Okay, so now, talking about our correlation value, when we talk about correlation, it gives you a strength and direction relationship. Okay, so when we're looking at these top graphs, these are all positive relationships. We're looking at the slope of the line, 
and we can see how we're starting with a positive weak relationship and then moving to a positive strong relationship. We can also have them in the negative sense for the relationship. So when we talk about correlations, that we can have a R value of zero all the way to positive one. And then we can also have R values from approximately zero all the way to negative one. Okay, the sign is based on the slope of the line. The value is based on the relationship between the two variables. How strong of a linear relationship is it? And what we really want to do is we would call this strong relationship. We would call this weak. And then what we can do is we can use moderate on the insides. So we can call this moderate strong, moderate weak. Okay, same thing down on the bottom. The only difference is that positive versus negative relationship. Okay, here is the formula for calculating R. Once again, you're not going to have to use it too often. Okay, but it does give us that direction and strength. Notice the formula uses the mean of x and y. So we're finding a distance from average divided by standard deviations. So this is kind of finding that z value or t value, multiplying the pair, and then adding it all up. Okay, very unlikely to use it, but it is something you could be asked to use. You just want to make sure you're plugging in the values properly and working your way through. Another term that we have to be able to know and describe is the coefficient of determination, or r squared. Okay, r squared tells us the proportion of variation in the y values, y variable, that is explained by the regression model including the x and y variables. Okay, always between 0 and 1. Notice that there's no negatives. Okay, because when we square that negative value, it becomes positive. Okay, but we're looking at these as a percentage of fit values. Okay, the higher the value, the better the model explains the response variable y overall. Okay, this is something that you do want to basically memorize this definition because it's one of the more common questions that you're asked either to describe what the R value means or they'll ask you a question using this terminology and you have to plug that value in for your answer. Okay, finishing up the association, we've got our positive and negative associated graphs. Okay, we want to be um, respectful of using the proper terminology when you're listing an answer, talking about that association of those two pieces. Okay, we already talked about strength, so we'll jump into our last piece about the line is the residual value. The residual value is one of the most important pieces in deciding whether or not a linear regression model is the most appropriate model overall. Okay, so when we look at our residual values, we can look at a couple of these residual plots. And the one thing that we're really looking for is a noticeable U-shaped or N-shaped pattern in the residuals. Okay, if they're scattered all over the place, okay, that is our best case scenario. A scattered residual plot tells you that your linear regression line is a good fit or good estimator of your data. As soon as you see this very clean pattern, you know, little jumps overall, but a very U-shaped pattern, okay, that tells us that this is a non-linear set of data no matter how strong your R value is. Okay, you would define it as a non-linear distribution when you're looking at that residual plot overall. Okay, now, how do we create a residual plot? I'm going to show you the quick method and the slow method. 
Okay, so we want to look at those two possibilities. I just got to check a setting on the calculator here, so I'm going to pause and be right All right, now that I know that I've got the setting, I didn't want to waste any of your time going through those steps. So the first thing we want to do is when we're given a set of data, we want to go into Stat, Edit, input all of your data into list one, list two, and now our next step is finding our least squares regression line. Okay, so we're going to go into stat, calculate, okay, linear regression, we want to use number eight, list one for x, list two for y, and then we do want to store our equation. We're going to store the equation in variables, y variables, function y1. Okay, so we're putting this in. If you can't remember how to get to this spot, what you would do is just go right to your y equals equation and um, plug in your linear regression line that you get here. You can just type in that equation into the y equals to get that piece. Okay, so we can see that this should give you your r or r squared value. If it doesn't, what you want to do is go into your catalog and scroll down until you see diagnostic and turn the diagnostic on. That gives you your r and r squared value. So now, once we have this linear regression, what we want to do is the residual plot is a graph of data. And the quickest graph that we can do is just a regular scatter plot. Okay, so when we do our li scatter plot, list one, list two, okay, we have these values overall. And then we want to zoom nine to show us our scatter plot. Now, what you can do to do a very quick residual graph is you can take your overall scatter plot and then what you want to do is turn your regression line into your horizontal axes. And then you can drop a vertical axis on that and now you have created a very rough sketch of your residual plot. We can look at this residual plot here. Okay, we see that it is a scattered residual plot. There isn't a clear pattern in this data that shows up U-shaped or N-shaped, so we could do that as well. Okay, now, how do you create an actual residual plot? Okay, if we go into Stat Edit, what we want to do is list three is going to become our estimated y values. So we want to go up and highlight the function and enter, and then we're going to pull in that y1 function that we put the equation into. And then we have to insert our list one x values. So when we do that, that gives us our estimated y values that we can compare to our actual y values. And we're going to do that in list four. So list four is your actual y minus your estimated y. And that gives you your residual value. Now, to make your residual plot, we're going to go back to our second stat plot function. Okay, select number one, and what we have to do is we have to change that secondary list to be our residual values. Okay, and then we go through and zoom nine. Okay, and you can see these two plots are very close to each other. Okay, very small difference between the two. As far as scaling, you know, this one is condensed a little bit compared to the other. Okay, but both residual plots should work for anything that you're required to do as a part of a test or problem. Now, when we're looking at graphs, two other pieces that we need to be able to describe, outliers and influential points. Okay, an outlier is a data point with a large residual value. Okay, so now you want to be careful. It's not a point that's far out in the graph, okay, because it might not have a large residual value. Okay, so we have to talk about an outlier 
as that value that has a large residual. And that is going to end up being what we call an influential point. Okay, when we talk about something being influential, okay, it's a point that influences greatly the least squares regression line. Okay, it will significantly change the slope, significantly change the y-intercept. Okay, it will change your r and r squared value. Now, we can't tell what the effect of a point is going to be on r or r squared. We can tell the effect of what's going to happen with the slope or y-intercept. Okay, if that value you have point-wise, and I'm just going to use one of these residual ones. Okay, this point right here, Okay, that's above the line. If we get rid of that point, the pull of that point is gone. The line is going to have a lower slope, and that will also cause it to have a higher y-intercept. Okay, so when we look at the influential points, it always pivots on your average of x, average of y's. And whether the point is above or below, okay, the line is going to move away from the influential point when that point is pulled out. And then you have to think about how it's pivoting in the center. And that pivot will move your y-intercept up or down. And that pivot will either flatten out your slope if that one is taken out. If we take out this point, that also means that it would go up and then move the y-intercept down when we're looking at those values. Okay, so now, okay, when we are working through and finishing up, we have to be able to read a computer printout because a computer printout is something that we can use for a lot of our problems. The computer printout gives us a lot of information. We just have to remember how it's organized. These coefficients are organized in alphabetical order. Coefficient of A first, coefficient of B second. Now, we've got standard errors. These are your standard deviations. Standard deviation of A, standard deviation of B. We're going to need that standard deviation of B later overall. Okay, gives you your R squared value, gives you your degrees of freedom, okay, and then you're also given S which is the standard deviation of your residual values. Okay, so we have all of this information housed within this one piece over all. Okay, so now, when we're working with the tables like that, they're going to usually ask us to do a test or an interval. Now, they could ask you to verify assumptions. They usually don't ask you to, but they could ask you to verify assumptions. And what we need, okay, we need three graphs, and we need to know that it's a simple random sample. We need your actual data plot and your residuals. So we've got those two. Remember, you can always use the actual data plot to create your residual. Okay, you need to show that it's random. That's the number one thing overall. And then we also need to know that it is a normal sampling distribution. Okay, so we have to do a box and whisker plot on the residual values to make sure that there is no extreme skew. Okay, now these are a little bit mixed up as far as the slides. So these two here are what you need to prove that it is a linear association. Okay, so you need to prove that it's random. You need to prove that it's a linear association. That's what the two graphs are for. Okay, we have the original graph. The residual graph shows us that there's no pattern. And then the last thing that we need to do is the normal sample distribution. And that's where we do a box and whisker on your residuals okay, to show that. Okay, so now, once we've verified our assumptions, now we're back into our standard procedures for a hypothesis test or a confidence interval. So looking at your hypotheses, 
Okay, we're always talking about beta, which is the true slope of the least squares regression line. Remember, we only have a sample. You know, so if we want the slope of the population least squares regression line, that's what beta is. And we always assume that there is no relationship, and we're trying to prove that there is a relationship. Okay, and in most cases, we're just going to go with a not equal to. If you do greater than or less than, you can be okay. Okay, but in a lot of cases, we're just going to use that not equal to situation. Like all hypotheses tests, make sure that you define your variables so the person reading your question knows what's being covered. Now, your calculations that you need. Okay, straight off of the formula sheet right here, test statistic. It is a T value because we have degrees of freedom. Okay, you've got your slope. Remember what beta is. Beta is almost always zero. And then you've got your standard error of the slope, which comes from your table. Okay, so when we're looking at our values, there's our B. Here's our standard error of B. And then we've got zero. So it's a very easy T value to calculate. 0.687 minus 0 divided by the standard error of B, and then you've got your T value. Okay, once you have your T value, then you know you always need to do a probability statement. Okay, T greater than less than your number equals blank. Okay, make sure that you have those pieces. Okay, now if you notice, you're actually given the T value, you're given the probability. One thing that you have to be careful of with this t value, this probability is for a not equal to. Okay, so if you're doing not equal to, you have to multiply whatever probability you find by 2 to be able to get that value. Okay, now finishing up, remember conclusions always need three things. State your evidence, make a conclusion about the null, and then make a statement about the alternative. Does it support or not support? Okay, now switching gears, if you have to do a confidence interval, something that they could ask you to do. Okay, once again, confidence interval formula comes right off of the formula sheet. Okay, what we need is B and S of B. Remember this T star comes from your T table. Okay, look up the confidence interval level on the bottom. Okay, find that specific value that you're looking for. Okay, and once again, the values come right off of the table. There's not a lot of calculation work you have to do. Okay, you just have to be able to go in and do the calculation. Show that you can plug the values in and then find your endpoints. Once you've found your endpoints, like always, we have to write a conclusion. Conclusion for the confidence interval needs the confidence level, the context of the problem, and the interval that you created. Okay, so here is a sample of a confidence interval conclusion for a linear regression interval. Okay, and that concludes. I know it's a lot of stuff there. Okay, you might want to go through this once or twice. Okay, but that does conclude our review of linear regression. Thanks.